Good afternoon, and thank you for having me, Emily, and thank you for that lovely uh, introduction, and greetings to Melanie as well. I'm looking forward to our conversation because Melanie, you know, I, I take my cues from Melanie all the time on, on these sorts of things. So, uh, no, thank you very much. Um, look, I'll, I'll speak initially for about 10 minutes just to kind of give us a, a bit of a background, a bit of a setting for how we might uh, talk about this and, uh, and the sorts of issues that I think uh, that we might want to to uh, take out of perhaps yesterday's speech and, and some of the recent visits and just, I guess, where Australia-Japan relations are now, where they could go uh, and what might be uh, down the track, even as far as 2050 uh, down the track. Um, so we can start with that, I guess. Um, Excellent. I think I would actually have to preface my comments, in fact, by saying that uh, anything we say today has to be <clears throat> taken up in the context of what will happen in the United States next week. So I think the outcome of uh, the presidential election next week is going to be quite important uh, for Japan and Australia uh, and uh, in terms of the directions that, uh, that we might go thereafter, depending on a, a Biden or a Trump win. So with that uh, caveat underpinning uh, all the things that I might want to uh, talk about today. I guess with uh, Suga coming into uh, to take the reins of power after Abe, it was in the end no real surprise. I mean, to talk from my Japanese politics uh, background, uh, it was a little bit of a, a throwback to the 1980s factional politics. So I guess anyone interested in how this is going to go is really going to have to come to grips with the factional politics of the LDP uh, again. Which, which really uh, came through in his support and in his uh, re-election. So that would be, be one thing uh, that I would say. And there was a lot of anticipation uh, of what sort of uh, prime minister he might become. He had, of course, been uh, cabinet secretary. We talk a lot about Abe's record breaking term uh, of seven years and eight months, but let's remember too that Suga held that position, uh, cabinet secretary for an equal amount of time in itself. Uh, it's its own sort of record. And so it wasn't probably, probably wasn't going to be a huge transition for Suga in as much as he's probably been the closest person to Abe over the last um, almost eight years. And so a bit of a power behind the scenes, perhaps, um, in terms of, of what, uh, what he might do. And I guess our biggest anticipation at the time was, will he make that transition from being, uh, you know, the, the, the cabinet secretary, the spokesperson, the, the one who has to deal with the media on a daily basis to becoming uh, prime minister. Now, I would say in, in short, in, um, uh, in the first six or so weeks that we've seen, I think he's made that transition reasonably well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised in the sort of directions uh, that he's taken. So uh, he really did uh, hit the ground running, I suppose. You could say with uh, the sorts of things that we might talk about as retail politics, what's going to really um, get the people behind him very much hip pocket sort of um, policies. Uh, let's get the, um, the cost for, for, tele for mobile phones down, for example, was, was one thing. Um, he was very quick to move on. Uh, what some people saw as a positive infertility uh, being available, infertility treatment being available on the National Health Service. Others saw it as a cynical move to try and, you know, um, improve Japan's ever decreasing birth rate. So that's a, a few pluses and minuses uh, on, on that one. His cabinet, I suppose, from a, uh, an advancing women in Japan perspective was somewhat of a disappointment um, with just two women in, uh, in cabinet positions. Um, Hashimoto Seiko continuing her position and uh, Kawakami returning to uh, Ministry of Justice. Uh, the rest again, very uh, factionally divvied up. So after we got through that first little bit of planning expectation and, and, uh, and running through, um, it was a matter of seeing where he was going to take uh, these issues and everything that, that hangs over or what hangs over at the moment um, is the response to COVID or, or the coronavirus as we continue to call it here in, in Japan and how that's going to be um, dealt with. I, I, I sense a kind of we're going to have to get used to living with corona 
um, shift in uh, from the government um, rather than aiming for any sort of elimination and so on. I just see that there are incremental moves almost on a daily basis now to kind of get used to it and, and, and work with it. So what uh, Suga intends or, or anticipates to do with with the uh, COVID response, although it's on top of his agenda, uh, will be an important one for us to, to look at and consider. In these, in these first month or so, of course, if we turn our attention to Australia specifically, we've, we've had some really interesting uh, movement on, on that front. Uh, we had the Quad meeting, of course, between uh, the United States, Australia, Japan, and India. Now, this has been a long held uh, dream of Abe, in fact, and you know we can go back to his uh, 2006 uh, book that he wrote, where he uh, talked about building this. Um, it was it was mostly with India, in fact. His his first intentions were to build this kind of alliance with with India. Um, the context of that, uh, if you go back and read the book, um, it's Shi Kunie, is in the context of how to deal with China. Um, and it also traces back to his grandfather's ambitions uh, in the region as well. So that's never really far away from what this quad uh, is, has been and what might be. Um, and I can certainly talk about that uh, a little bit more later if, if, we, uh, if we need to. Uh, we then had the visit by uh, Minister Reynolds uh, on the defence front. So here already we can see where Australia is uh, positioning itself. Uh, we've got foreign policy on the one hand as, as being uh, a key and building this quad um, alliance. I'll use the term as an international relations specialist, I'll use the term carefully. Um, and what might happen in the region as a result of that and uh, Minister Reynolds coming through with uh, her visit uh, and again kind of building up some would call a kind of a, a greater trust relationship between the defence forces of both uh, countries uh, was one of the first meetings that uh, Kishi Abe's brother um, had as defence minister had with a foreign uh, defence minister so we can already see pretty quickly, I guess, the priorities that uh, the Australian government might be putting on on the direction of this um, this relationship. Um, there, so there are a couple of key things that I think we can we can come back and address. One other issue that that does keep coming up that I think is important we, when we talk in bilateral relations terms. I think we often sort of leave behind what's happening on the domestic front that might really be of import to to people who really want to try and um, see what's what's going on. And pretty quickly, and I think this is the the one uh, one of the, the damaging things for for Suga. Pretty quickly, um, we learned of his um, rejection of the nomination of six academics to the Science Council of. Japan. Now people will say, oh yeah, you know, you would say that you're an academic. And yeah, I would say that because I'm an academic, but also academic freedom uh, is, is highly regarded here in Japan. Um, probably more so these days than Australia. Um, it, it does, it's very important that this Science Council is seen as being independent. Um, the uh, concerns that there might be in any way, and one of the debates that's been running through uh, the university sector in the last few years is that no university research should at all be um, linked to anything that might be seen as developing uh, military potential or any of those sorts of relations. And this has become quite uh, an issue between the university sector and the government. Uh, in recent years, and now this has been compounded by uh, six eminent scholars, I have to say, and I, I say that in terms that I do use their work, their texts in, in my classes. Um, and what has happened is this has actually been now been carrying on for a couple of weeks. Now, Suga could have stopped this in its tracks and said, I made this decision because um, he hasn't given reasons 
And so this is going to continue to fester away. And this links back, I mean, if one of the, the, the constants during the latter part, particularly of Abe's um, term, was just this disregard for what a lot of us would consider um, emerging scandals constantly. Things that, that uh, prime ministers and, and ministers in the past would have uh, resigned over just kept coming up. Now we know that Suga had a strong hand in keeping those issues um, down and, and, and uh, irrelevant. There's this kind of divide that, well, you know, it's only certain parts of, of uh, society that really care about those things. But in terms of um, some of the broader issues of democracy, and here's me putting my academic hat on, and I apologise in, in front of such an esteemed audience of uh, business and, and economics inclined people, but if on the one hand you're presenting yourself, projecting yourself in the region as an important country with strong liberal and democratic values, if that's not being seen and not being reflected in, in how you're working in a domestic uh, environment, <clears throat> then really you can only sort of take that kind of reputation uh, so far. So um, I certainly don't want to spend, I could spend a lot of time on that particular issue. Um, but, I, but, but it is again one of the, one, one of these potential scandals to potentially niggle away. I mean it, it was reflected in, in uh, uh, the opinion polls very quickly. I mean um, you know, his, his immediate popularity dropped uh, quite substantially. So it may continue to just be there on, on, the, uh, on the burner and something we will have to be um, aware of. I guess too, just in the last couple of minutes, I'll, I'll just reflect more closely on uh, yesterday's parliamentary address. Now, this is an important one too for us to, to take a look at it, uh, for any prime minister who gives his uh, first, still his, uh, one day her uh, first address to, to Parliament, it will give us a sense of um, what he expects the government to achieve. It's really setting out to the opposition parties, here's our agenda, you know, um, please cooperate with us to, to get this done in all these sorts of things. Um, and it gives us a sense perhaps of who uh, the Prime Minister uh, is who he wants to be and what he wants for uh, the country. Now on that latter point there's been a lot of criticism that there wasn't a lot of sense of Suga talking about his vision for Japan and what, what it might become. Um, I'm kind of not surprised by that because I don't get a sense that, that Suga is himself quite effusive in that way, save uh, his uh, address in Vietnam recently where he introduced himself uh, and uh, to the to the hall it, using a little bit obviously of a Vietnamese that he'd been taught and he just broke into this little smile and I thought gee Mr Suga we'd like to see a bit more of that from you than uh, than the all-time serious sort of face that, that you have on and so you know there's I guess perhaps if you sort of scratch the surface, there's, there's something there to, to work with. A couple of the key issues that I thought about um, with, with the speech yesterday, and there's, there's still quite a bit to work through and the opposition response uh, that will come up in the next couple of days. Some of the things that I think of Australia is looking forward to what we can do uh, with Japan outside this mm, security realm. Um, a couple of points that came up a couple of uh, Suga's particular interests, agricultural reform. I think Australia and Japan have really got some, a long historic base in that, that, that they can um, use and, and, uh, and make much of that. And tourism, now tourism, inbound tourism has been a big part of uh, Suga's work uh, in, as, as, a, as a parliamentarian. He, he sort of boasted about that as being his, um, one of the things he was very keen on. So I think that's uh, an area that um, Australia and Japan can start to look beyond just the very narrow confines of a security relationship. I think we really need to open up uh, a, a little bit more back to where we, where we were once upon a time, a little bit um, broader in our relationship. Um, and of course, something we all have to, I think, from an Australian point of view, pay attention to is his declaration that Japan would be carbon neutral by 2050 um, and looking at renewables uh, to a lesser extent nuclear power, but the renewables. Um, now I think this 
ought to be a wake up call uh, for the Australian government uh, to continue to persist with uh, coal uh, and expectation, you know, China is reducing coal imports. <clears throat> Australia doesn't want to be left behind at this stage on what is now apparently uh, a trend uh, worldwide. And I think, you know, in, in terms of looking at the future, there, there are at least a couple of points that I think we can uh, probably talk about. And I think I've come to my 10 minute intro. So I shall give it back over to Melanie. Thank you, Donna. And uh, just let me echo um, Emily's comments earlier, how grateful we are for you being part of uh, today's webinar. I know there's keen interest um, in uh, Japan at the moment. Um, and I don't think we could have timed it any better than today, um, given that we can um, reflect on the policy speech that, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, um, had a lot of issues or, or uh, sort of a lot of domestic, and people are saying it was 80% domestic. Well, you can't expect in these economic times, mm. I think that it would be anything but, but still a lot of uh, areas that I think will be interesting for Australia and Japan to consider. Um, I, and particularly uh, today, I wanted to get a few questions and we've had a couple come through now, um, but anybody who's got any questions, I know that Donna is very um, open and uh, she will welcome the questions. And as long as they're all good ones, as we used to say at the chamber, we'll um, take them on board. So thank you in advance to everybody for sending us anything and everything that you'd like. Um, one of the areas of concern that I have um, uh, about, you know, things matters Japan, I guess, um, from an Australian perspective sometimes is the, uh, you know, the, the uh, obviously the pandemic has um, emphasised this further. The area where, you know, business uh, is obviously heavily involved in Japan, the two-way trade is, you know, extensive, the investment in Australia is extensive, and we have a terrific um, trade and economic partnership. Um, but, you know, we only have one media representative um, in Japan at the moment. Um, that's reduced from about four or five back in the day. And I just wonder, um, you know, our business community in the chamber, we do everything we possibly can to raise the profile of, of Japan in Australia. Um, but without that sort of uh, deep analysis, uh, I think it's sometimes difficult for people in Australia to see exactly what might be happening. Um, you know, we... I monitor the Australian press and see that there is hardly any mention um, of Japan, uh, mostly, which is, of course, something that we all work very hard to change. Um, I was, however, interested to see the response to um, Suga's policy speech vis-a-vis -vis the carbon-free uh, statement. And I think with you, just um, before we started, worked out uh, that I will at least be something like 80 six uh, by the time that target is met. So I, I don't even know that I'll be around. Um, but at any, in any case, I think it's uh, uh, certainly on social, need, on social media, it's been met with a lot of interest. And I just see now the, um, the Finn has put up a piece where it says, with this announcement, the Japanese government has effectively served Australia's fossil fuel industry with divorce papers. <laughs> now, that's a, an interesting expression. Um, but over and above that, I know you mentioned the agriculture um, reforms. And business, you know, environment push is so interesting, um, potentially for Japan and also where you think the business community might come. Thank you. Uh, that's a it's a wide ranging, wide ranging question. Can I can I begin by echoing your concerns um, of the business community about getting, um, you know, traction in Australia about Japan these days? I mean, you and I have sort of coincidentally been coming and going from this country for about the same um, length of, of time, and uh, you know, I, I came here in the first big Japan bubble, but was probably the second, literally, but in the 80s, you know, and, and uh, the whole sort of, um, if you came to Japan to visit, and I can remember bringing two cent coins because they had the frilly neck lizard, which was a huge thing, great, cheap way to sort of get all your presents done, you know, bring in a roll of, um, you know, Eri Maki Tokage. Um, you know, and, and so there was this big push, so I, I would echo um, our business colleagues' concerns from the educational point of view. I mean, what has happened in the last 30 years in Australia is, and, it, it, and I've said this in other fora as well, is that Australia tends to be so focused on what economic and trade gains it's going to get out of the region that it, it, it 
pushes its policy uh, in that way. So whereas we were all studying Japanese and learning Japanese and thinking Japan was going to be in our future 30 years ago, well, maybe not you, Millie, but it was that long ago for me. Um, you know, when the, the China wave came through, um, after Japan kind of dropped out and, and the China wave came through and, you know, everyone sort of turned their attention to China and, and Japan went off um, went off the radar a little bit. I think in this respect, business and education, educators like myself, um, another role I have in, in the interest of um, transparency, another role I have here at Masashima University is I'm director of um, sort of effectively PVC of international relations here as well. So I'm responsible for getting exchanges going. And, you know, we, we tend to find that the uh, businesses in Australia are perhaps reluctant to take on someone who spent time in Japan and, and studied Japan and knows about Japan because what else can you do? Well, if you've managed to, to work out, work through part of your life, living in another country, independence, learning another language, um, you know, I, th I think it shows you've got some initiative to, to get in and, and do other things. So there's, there's partly a bit of reluctance. And, and I'm not saying that about businesses that, that work directly with Japan, but, but others um, that may not sort of recognise the advantages of, of that. But also, too, for me, with, with Japanese students here, is, is encouraging them to go to Australia. Mm. Um, you know, fortunately, we're past the hurdles that we used to have where Japanese people thought that German was our first language. And I still remember my first job as an, you know, a, a English conversation uh, teacher being told my English was excellent. How long did I spend in the United States? No time at all. Um, you know, so we're past that, but um, there's still a kind of a, you know, what trying to encourage students to go to uh, Australia and, and likewise Australian students coming to Japan there's there's a hurdle there now and again it's the university system that's kind of um, compressing it making it difficult um, with uh, giving students the time the opportunity that they need uh, to do that so I think there's a lot more you know I, I'm not all that keen on the way we all sort of fall into our various little silos of you know, business is over here and education is over here and, and all the rest. I think probably from, you know, we, we do, we can do a lot more. Productive. And I guess today is, is an opportunity for that. And I, I am, again, grateful. It's not um, a forum I thought I'd, I'd ever really be speaking at, but I'm grateful for that opportunity because, you know, if it, if, if it at least is uh, an element that we can start to, to bring those ties together, I think that's really, really important. We all have a lot to give each other. Uh, from our various experiences, and I think that's that's important. So, having said that, we've now got this uh, goal of 2050, and uh, what it means for renewables uh, and and so on. And I think the divorce papers look that's interesting. I spent a large chunk of my postgraduate life looking through many many years of um, resources uh, trade and the resources economy, as it was referred to at the time. And, uh, you know, finished my PhD almost 20 years ago now that that actually established that what Japan and, and Australia have built over the years since uh, the end of World War Two in the resources. And, you know, it was sort of my conclusion at the time is, is we can actually take what we share and, and this um, bilateral uh, sort of cooperation we have on, on resources and look to the future and once coal becomes the, you know, no longer the, the um, resource that people want, having built over 30 years, 40 years, a strong partnership on what I call resource security. So we go back to this um, notion of security, which I think is now defined far too narrowly. Um, and, and look at what we can actually achieve. Now, that's probably in, in the present circumstances going to take a little bit of a, a change of uh, heart, change of attitude in, in recent Australian governments, which are still holding on to, you know, the only asset we have is, is to export coal. We're, we're rich in other resources um, and renewables. And if Australia and Japan, Japan can actually take this up, um, you know, move beyond this, what we've, we've kind of narrowed our relationship from what it was. You know, it used to be a very 
complex, um, all sorts of areas, you know, that, that whether it was education and business and, and so on. And over the last 10 years or so, we tend to really narrow the focus on this, this sort of defence. I would rather use defence rather than, than security. But if we think about security more broadly, you know, and, and how we can, can secure the region more broadly, it's, it's not with, you know, how many military exercises and, and submarines and, you know, exchanges we can have in that way. It's actually building a sense of uh, security through um, what we call in, in peace studies, more of a sense of a, of a positive peace. So that there is no, um, you know, SDGs, the, the um, Sustainable Development Goals at the moment, are, are big in Japan. And if Australia wanted to kind of assert its leadership in the region, instead of, you know, sitting under the umbrella, that, that uh, US umbrella, if we want to assert both countries, uh, once again, assert a kind of a, a leadership in the region, you know, the security development goals, the, the expansion, the, the broadening of our security relationship, the, the, uh, the willingness to take on other sources, uh, other resource uh, efficiencies would be an important one to do at the, at the moment. Well, that uh, it all um, is, as you said earlier, um, rather difficult to sort of imagine at the moment, given that we're only a few days out uh, from the US election. And um, obviously for Japan, that has a very different uh, sort of, um, well, it's, it's a very different issue than it is mm. for Australia, given the, the defence and the, and the security angle. Um, can I ask you what you think a Japan, a, a Biden presidency means for Japan, as opposed to a continuation of the Trump presidency? A couple of um, Japanese politicians and, in fact, business people have said to me quite recently that they feel that even though they wouldn't say this publicly, that um, it's essentially um, probably better to sit with status quo, um, given the relationship that Abe um, developed with um, President Trump. Now, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to give my views on that at this particular point, um, but at this stage, I am very interested to know, you know, whether you, like, what do you see would be the, the, the major marker of difference, at least? Well, I, I think it's it's probably a good time for us um, should Biden uh, win next week. I think it would be a good time to move away from this personality-driven foreign policy. You know, the you know the, the the policy is only going to work because of Abe's relationship with with Trump, or you know that's. I guess from a foreign policy perspective, it's not a particularly professional way to be dealing with, with your foreign policy. So I sense that Suga being Suga and what he's demonstrated uh, to us over the last few weeks, you know, he'll be, um, well, we saw it when he, he met with Pompeo and, and the others during the quad. He'll see it as his duty to to meet with people and, and talk with people. I, I I wouldn't mind seeing a toning down of this uh, sense of the personal is so important in in these foreign policy relationships. And I think if Biden uh, does that, Biden clearly also has a heck of a lot on his plate. Uh, should he win with with COVID? I mean, we can be just thankful that here in Tokyo we're only looking at two hundred plus or minus each day in terms of cases. Um, I think probably the first year really for a, a new US president, for Biden, uh, should he be successful, is really going to be about containing uh, COVID before he can really move on to any... And I suspect there'll be a bit of a, um, a return to the kind of the Obama... Now, I know there was a lot of criticism about the Obama uh, policy towards uh, Northeast Asia particularly, but I think it will, will tone, tone it down a little bit and, and give people a little bit of a chance to think about where the move might go, where, where they might move next. Also, I thought it was interesting um, to hear on some of those Sunday morning political programs that you and I love, um, mention of an event that took place on Sunday night, which is the sort of 
supporters of other um, gathering and you know um, it's always interesting to see who's attending of course but it sort of highlighted that potentially there might be a role for Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe, as a sort of an envoy, as was discussed around the time of the change. But I do note in the policy speech a very strong reference by Prime Minister Suga to the focus that he can actually handle this as well. And I guess that very quick um, move to go to Vietnam and also then on to Indonesia. Indonesia was one of those areas of, of demonstration. So his sort of outward focusing um, area will will probably play further um, as we get past this sort of need to be domestic focused and pragmatic about what can in fact happen. You know, and I hear a lot about the shift in terms of Japan, you know, the digital, um, digital transformation, um, the shifting um, in terms of the focus of the administration uh, reforms ministry with um, Minister Kornor. I'm cracking the whip there, I hear. I don't know that I'd want to be a bureaucrat working there at the moment because I think they're probably very late nights um, on the books. But, you know, the um, I've heard some very interesting snippets of conversation around inheritance tax for foreign residents and the like. Um, and with Hong Kong's um, issues uh, in, in the region, we've had a, an interesting question from Andrew Gauchi, um, who has uh, asked that I ask you whether you believe that uh, some of those opportunities that might be might play out a little bit more because of the US-China tensions in the region um, will be something that Suga can sort of jump jump on. I mean, can he, you know, make Japan more attractive a destination for not only investment, because there's obviously a lot of investment in any case, but for businesses setting up here or for the startup um, community or for entre entrepreneurs to be working and what have you, you know, is there more, uh, is there more room to move and will Suga jump on that, do you think? Will he use those opportunities to his advantage? Look, there's been some indications um, sometimes on those Sunday morning programs that we like to watch um, and some of the late night programs that I also tend to watch. Um, but yes, with with the with word that Seoul in, in South Korea had is potentially the financial destination for um, Northeast Asia coming through. The, the little bit of response that I saw to that was, well, why wouldn't people come to Tokyo? And I think there was a bit of a, mm. uh, a initially a knee-jerk reaction, but a kind of, well, hang on, well, what are they doing that we can do uh, that perhaps we can shift, you know, and, and make uh, Tokyo uh, or perhaps Osaka, you know, to be fair to our Osaka friends, um, one of the hubs of, um, you know, financial um, operations and, and so on in the region. And I think as this digitalization uh, push goes both with Suga and Kono, um, I think that is quite obviously an area. And it, it might come down to a little bit of lobbying from um, some, you know, some people in the uh, international community here in, in Japan to say, well, you know, if you did a few more things like this, we could actually start to make, you know, bring Tokyo back to a more central position. And so, you know, again, that, that's just the way we all work here, you know, sort of mm. chatting to people and, and encouraging them and saying, well, you know, while they're doing that here, have you thought about this? And it'll mm. work its way up the up advocacy the as well, you know, in, in that, in the true sense of the word from business and, and also from um, government, um, mm. quite um, it'll bring some interesting change, that's for sure. Um, I had a question via LinkedIn, actually, from an old um, friend of mine who asked whether uh, you thought that um, Prime Minister Suga would in any way change his view of, uh, say, for example, previously signed um, agreements such as the Japan-Australia Free Trade Agreement, or JIPA, as it's known. Um, do you see that he would take any sort of, retro not retrospective, but, but in his push to sort of have Japanese agricultural products more competitive and or more on the international stage? Is there potentially conflict for us at any point? Oh, I'm one of those academics who doesn't like to predict. <laughs> Very reluctant to sign a forecast. Um, but I look, look back to look forward. Look again, I think um, part of this is again, uh, who gets Suga's ear and who gets to put uh, ideas to him. And I guess I would, in this respect, sort of go back to one of um, my little, well, let's call it a hobby horse, I, I, I guess, from, from many, many years of, of looking at the Australia-Japan relationship in a foreign relations and international relations uh, sense. 
I think, as I said before, we're, we're closing in, we're closing down on what the Australia-Japan relationship could be. This, this focus on the quad, this focus on security, the, the ministerial meetings coming in at two plus two, you know, we're having the, the foreign ministers and defence ministers talking and so on. Back in the old days, um, we had a very broad, a much broader um, cabinet level set of meetings, almost annually, sort of shifting around to one and one and a half year um, slots through the 70s and 80s that really established a strong foundation for um, the, the, the breadth of Australia-Japan relations. It included all the relevant ministers at the time, not just, well, they didn't have security and defence ministers back then, did they? Um, so it was foreign policy. It was, there was um, agricultural, you know, the, all, they were all sitting around the table at the same time, breaking off into their little groups as well. But, but all their, and I think this is where we sometimes get lost in, you know, a, a trade agreement or a security agreement or, you know, an educational exchange agreement. We, we tend to do them all quite separately. And I think really for, as, as we move on into the 20, further and further into the 20th, First century, 2050 indeed, halfway through. I, I think it's a, a time to sort of go back to having that, that broader perspective brought in. Um, I know that, you know, officials on either side think, oh God, imagine trying to bring, um, you know, seven or eight ministers on either side, bringing their diaries in. Well, we can do it here on Zoom these days. You know, we don't actually all have to fly in and and fly out. It, it can be probably easier now than it was um, that many years ago. And I think just to, and, and then they said, oh yes, but you know, we all get to do that at APEC and, and so on. It's like, yeah, it's not quite the same thing. Here's a focus two or three days um, where everyone who's concerned about, um, you know, the breadth of the relationship and can, you know, sort of sit there with, with the Lego blocks on the table and shift them around as need be. And, and bring it all together um, at the end. And I think in that way, you can sort of reflect and, and put into context the importance of something like the free trade agreement in the context of the broader relationship. Um, and, and likewise with another, you know, several of the other aspects. So if you can start to refresh and, and redo and go back to the past to bring our relationship forward, that's kind of one of the things I'd be, be looking at. And, and it, it brings to the point of, um, you know, it keeps things like the free trade agreement um, to the fore and maybe he'll realise there's some significance there. He could get his family strawberries out to Australia, you know. Exactly. And they're very good strawberries. Well, indeed. And he likes to talk about them. But <laughs> the, uh, I think that would be a terrific idea and, and COVID and has shown us that a virtual uh, sort of, you know, dialogue could in fact be possible. Mm. And um, I'm sure there are um, many others who are thinking of similar issues. And I mean, I back in the day, I used to interpret at some of those sessions and I know how the logistics were um, really um, tricky. So perhaps the virtual um, world will allow us. And as you say, that could be something, therefore you'd have representatives of the business community. You could then have agriculture, you could have defense, you could have everybody sort mm. of more sort of aligned, well, at least, um, updating each other yeah. about different things, I think, in, in that sense. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, defence and uh, security, and, and I know this is an area that you are um, well-versed in. So I want to, uh, I've got a question from Josh that asks, is it likely there'll be more collaboration on defence with Australia? And then I thought I'd also tie in another earlier question um, that he presented to us about um, how are there any notice, noticeable or sort of notable areas of difference between um, Prime Minister Suga's policy priorities vis-a-vis -vis defence and, you know, obviously playing out, as you said, the Quad um, initiative that is something that he was heavily involved in as Chief Cabinet Secretary, of course. And, I'll, and also how that plays out for any potential areas of constitutional revision, because I don't think there was much in it yesterday, was there, no. about that, um, no. impact, which was probably a departure from previous policy statements. No. But your views on policy from Abe to Suga, how it might change, and then if you see that there are areas where we can collaborate, uh, Australia and Japan. Mm. Well, I've got one other final question is, um, Japan is developing the next generation of fighter jets. So I think that was a reference to perhaps, you know, additional sort of engagement. 
over to you, expert. <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm a peace studies lecturer. That's my perspective. Um, we talked just in last week's lecture about the security dilemma and, and the more you build up security, the more others around you will build their security. And, and so you get this upward spiral constantly about, which, you know, to me leads to insecurity. You know, the more you, you build up um, those sort of security. So I, I think this is, this is not a path that I think Australia and Japan should have gone down. Uh, and I've written extensively about that uh, in other, and spoken about it extensively in other uh, places to the point of being almost a pariah within the um, within the community. But I think it's a, again it's 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 lacking an imagination of where Australia and Japan might have gone. It's it's still possible um, that we we can in fact uh, go there. Um, I, I think um, to sort of tie this into the constitutional revision. Look, Suga hasn't outright said he doesn't want to pursue it, but it's I, I don't I haven't seen yet anything from him that suggests he's going to pursue it in the with the with the passion that uh, that Abe uh, wanted to do, um, and and so um, you know that that might uh, just put a little bit of a, a lid on that. It'll keep simmering away, I think, but it'll it will uh, sit back uh, for just now. Do you think that group that uh, had its meeting or it's some, um, you know, gathering on Sunday night, mm. is that a push by people to give um, former Prime Minister Abe a sort of a, a, a vehicle by which he can independently do this, or is it, or is the issue really well and truly over? Look, it's it's never really truly over. I mean, it's been it's been there for fifty years. I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's never you know, it's never really been fully settled. Um, look, Abe can't. Yeah, well, I mean, sure, he, he's, for the time being, as we understand, he's going to remain in Parliament and he can sort of do that from the sidelines as as a Member of Parliament, keep pushing that, that sort of thing. But ultimately, any constitutional change has to come down to a referendum. And if he's not in a position within Parliament to get the numbers required to, to get the referendum underway, then it's just, you know, unlikely at this stage. And as I said, I haven't seen anything from Suga, but I'm not... I'm not counting it out by any means, but uh, or discounting it by any means. But I haven't seen anything that it's something that he really wants to to jump in and do. I mean, if he wanted to, he could have said it yesterday, um, you know, in in stronger terms. Um, I think he's much more focused on on some more major domestic issues. It's he's also positioning himself too. I think there was a a sense, if you remember, six weeks ago when he came in, we might have been having an election this. This weekend, there was talk of an election at the end of October. Um, well, clearly he thinks he's got the confidence and the mandate of the people to continue on. There's now talk that uh, his term as um, the president of the LDP and, and the next uh, election is due in September, October next year. Now there's talk that he's not going to take this kind of, I'm just the um, interim prime minister lying down. He's going to push uh, forward and, and uh, you know, continue. So. He might take this year as a as a kind of a getting comfortable in the position. Maybe if he comes through to another term, he might gear up um, with with constitutional change and so on. Um, but as I said, you know, to get back to the Australia trend, look, I think on the current trajectory, because um, that's kind of where we're taking things at the moment. And going back to Linda Reynolds' visit recently. There is going to be more defence cooperation. I mean, Australia is now participating with India and, and so on in the Quad. And again, as a as a peace studies, look, straight up as a peace studies person, I think this is not um, a useful direction for Australia and Japan to go. Again, we sit in under the um, US uh, umbrella on on several levels. I think there are other ways that we can assert um, value in the relationship in the region uh, without playing along on this. You know, not, well, Japan could quite quickly turn into a, a, a large military power if it wanted to. Australia can't. So let's not play too much in this kind of playground. Let's focus on what we can do uh, as, as two longstanding, you know, countries in the region. And, and what, are they, what are some of those things that you think we should be doing? Then? 
Well, it, it sort of goes back to, to what I, I, I talked about before. I mean, the SDGs, sure, they're, they're kind of some United Nations, oh, here we go again, you know, the Millennium Goals didn't work, so let's try another set. But they've been taken up by almost, you know, you, you see it everywhere, by almost every universe, uh, every, every newspaper, and I should say, yes, my university uh, has taken it up as, as well as, and as building it into our curriculum. And, and there's a genuine desire on the part of of people to again it's broadening out this idea of security taking it back to i mean if we remember back in the 80s 70s and 80s when japan was very much more constrained with its military it defined security as a comprehensive security you know and i think i i often go back to that that we need to be more comprehensive in our security and ideas and and what it means for building up um you know um getting rid of poverty. If you look at the 17 goals of the SDGs, there are so many um, there that Australia, Japan can, can just work on as, you know, getting back to that good international citizenship kind of approach to, to the region. I think we need to, to turn down the, the temperature on the, the defence build-up in the region, frankly, because where is that going to take us? Where is that going to lead us? Um, well, just on that then, Donna, I know um, obviously you, um, you know, follow the, the uh, um, analysis in the newspapers and on social media um, very keenly. But, you know, how um, Japan is obviously watching very carefully how the uh, Australia-China relationship mm. pans out. What have been your sort of reflections or what, what have you seen that might be of interest to this um, group in terms well, of how it reflects or how... what? What, what does it say at the moment? Well, certainly one of the things that I have seen uh, more and more that I, I haven't seen in, in ways previously is probably over the last three or so months, and I'll, you know, anyone can go back and investigate my Twitter feed because I tend to tweet these things out a bit. It's surprising in a way just how much Japanese media, and, and this is just the general media, um, is, is picking up on the... Um, the tensions between Australia and China. Now, I think there's a couple of things going on here. Um, one is it might be as a signal for Japan to say, all right, if things start going badly there, what's going to happen with Japan? Because Japan, on the other hand, is trying to um, actually cultivate its relationship with China, despite the tensions at one level, um, security and other issues at one level, it, it continues to work um, and, and um, cultivate the economic issues. And that's where, again, the, the factional politics are quite important. So Nikai, who from, from Okayama, who is Suga's main backer, uh, is, you know, very, what would you say, keen that Japan and China maintain uh, strong relationships. So if Australia at the moment kind of starts to alienate itself from China, whether it's due to US pressure or for whatever reason, domestically, Australia thinks uh, it's, it's worth alienating China. I think it's, uh, what would you say, it's, it's going to, to cause some, some issues, I guess, between Japan, China and Australia that we, we have to look carefully at. I mean, those reports that we see here in the media between Australia and Japan, you know, it talks about uh, the trade disputes. It went into one of the programs went into great detail about the the journalists uh, being uh, returned. The NHK correspondent in Sydney uh, did a fairly um, reflective and, and deep piece a couple of weeks ago, and it does kind of come back to what Japan keeps pointing out is that it comes back to uh, Prime Minister Morrison's um, speech in April where he said, you know, we've really got to, you know, to the WHO has really got to sort of crack, crack down on China. And so um, I think Japan's watching a little bit warily as what sort of punishment is China going to mete out to Australia for these sorts of things. And might the same happen with Japan? And so maybe Japan should look at uh, cultivating its relationship in a, in a different way. It's certainly from the business community's point of view, I think an opportunity for us to um, encourage our Australian colleagues to, and New Zealand colleagues as well, of course, 
to invest further in Japan. Um, one of our um, issues as raised earlier in, the, in this webinar is the um, presence of some terrific Australian and New Zealand companies here, um, but there are many, many more who we would mm. welcome to be part of the community. Mm. That would then of course demonstrate to the Japanese community that we have a broader um, base and that we're ongoing in terms of our commitment, et cetera. I mean, you know, early in the um, tensions um, with uh, between Australia and Japan, China when it was just the Bali conversation, you know, somebody wrote to me and said, could I help them find um, a market, you know, could I find customers to sell some Bali very quickly? Well, no, um, because you haven't been coming to Japan for a long time, my friend, and so, and, and you know, you want to help people out, but at the same time, um, long-term focus on Japan is very much needed by not only, as you say, the business community, but also the um, broader people-to-people -people linkages, which is reflected through all of the great work that's done by Australia Japan societies and, and the sister cities and states and things like that, which I guess has to just get a sense of how it can play out in this sort of coronavirus, you know, post-corona, with corona um, times as well. Mm. I wanted to ask you, we've only got um, probably time for two more um, questions, but I'm fascinated, as you know, about how um, uh, Japan grapples with one of the major issues, you know, being demographics. Um, I saw yesterday great mention by the Prime Minister about the need to um, slow the, um, the lowering um, birth rate and to put in place more policies for um, Japanese families such that they can access paternity um, leave and allowances. Indeed, the um, infertil infertility um, uh, support um, even discussion around the morning after pill, you know, those things are quite uh, unusual for Japan to be sort of grappling with, I guess. Um, there was one tiny reference to um, a, a, a policy uh, that will be announced by the end of the year. I'm sure you saw it, uh, how women can shine. Um, and I quickly sent off a note saying, I think that this pressure all the time on women to shine is, um, is um, problematic. But do you see him being a prime minister that will um, push forward on that on that area, or will it be just something that pays out as we've seen it before? No, it's interesting. As you say, Shine, I'm looking at my vision here. On, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I should have had a bit more light on this side, perhaps. But anyway, maybe I'm not one of the ones to shine. That's probably me. Um, look, I have to say, I was a little bit surprised when when Suga came out. Um, with this infertility policy as being one of his um, major policies. And I thought, I wonder where that's actually coming from. And But a part of me also said, well, well, good, it's putting an important policy there up front, um, along with all the other things um, that people need to be paying attention to. On the declining fertility, look, it's it's interesting, again, in this, this COVID, post-COVID world, and we're seeing uh, a lot of people who've been living and working in Tokyo and now finding that they're working online. So in fact, mm. heck, I could go back to Hokkaido and do exactly this, this mm. job, or I could go back to, you know, my region and, and do this sort of job as well. And it will free up time. It might, you know, the, the, the post COVID world, if we can all come to terms with it in, in really positive ways, might just have people reevaluating uh, what's important and if, if if young couples for example can move out of Tokyo and back to a, a, a larger cheaper or more inexpensive place to live and breathe and, and all that there might be some um, flow back on on that um, aspect in terms of the the declining birth rate on the other hand you know I mean I'm talking to, to students all the time in their you know late teens early 20s and they're the, the sort of um, people that these policies are targeted towards. And I have a number of students saying, well, so what if Japan's population decreases? Wouldn't that be a good thing in terms of a more sustainable environment? So, you know, I think at, at some point where we, we have focused very much for many, many years on, um, you know, a declining birth rate is a bad thing. Maybe at some point people are going to turn around and say, well, well, hang on, maybe we ought to be looking at the positives that might come out of this and uh, and how we can deal with that down the track. Well, speaking as a grandmother of three, I've sort of done my piece, I think, in terms of keeping it ticking along. But well, you've done a lot, thank you, because I'm a child. Yeah. <laughs> well, woman, you, know, so. you can share mine. <laughs> The, uh, the area, I guess, of interest is how um, we, we um, support women uh, be 
getting back into well getting into the, um, the workplace um, and maybe um, this post-COVID sort of environment um, allows albeit that the greatest pressure on um, women has taken place in this time um, that's not necessarily something that is just known to Japan that's in probably all sorts of um, countries but um, I was also interested to see when one of the earlier statements by the Prime Minister, by Suga, you know, reference to the domestic violence um, uh, issue mm. and how he wants to ensure that single mothers are better supported. And so I think that's a sign that there is there are people listening. And as you said earlier, it's really who's doing that for them. Um, I know when I spoke to somebody recently and said, all right, well, if they get the mobile phone um, issue up, what what is next? And he said, well, it has to be the um, surnames uh, that Japanese women can keep their, um, their, um, their given names. And because there's really nothing to lose, no political capital that you spend on that type of thing. So they're all good things, I think, for Japan. And mm. will probably make people sit up and, and say, wow, there's stuff happening in Japan. And, and as you say, um, noted by other countries, um, especially seeing China make mention of the net zero um, statement yesterday, I thought was very interesting. Mm. Now, time for our final question, which is really just a, an, a comment and a chance for you to wrap up um, your thoughts. But um, we um, have seen a number of visits um, by obviously the foreign minister, the defence minister, and at some stage it is mooted that we will have a um, visit uh, by um, our prime minister. Um, and, and, and either before or following um, him, there are likely to be other um, foreign ministers and, and prime ministers coming to Japan. Do they see a different Japan now as a result of COVID? Um, do they, will, they, will they see a different set of circumstances that we then have to take into consideration? Are there new industries? Um, is the focus on manufacturing here something that should be something where um, manufacturing closer to home in terms of the supply chain management? Um, is it something that we should be talking about our students when they come back to Japan and borders are opened up, of course, that they then get involved in looking at different areas? What, what type of a Japan will our Prime Minister see or should he be looking for if and when he comes to Japan? Mm. Well, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, he might be here for much more than what a day or two seems to be the average uh, Prime Ministerial visit these days. And so it's going to be very hard. Uh, to do anything substantial, I think. And I think the briefing that goes before him is going to be incredibly important. And indeed, I would suggest that it focuses on the very sorts of things that you've just spoken about. Let's face up to it. This will be a post, well, whatever the post-COVID world will be. Um, we don't know what, um, you know, the new Japan will look like. We don't know yet what the new Australia will look like. But let's just see what we can, what can come of that. And, and instead of sort of going back to our, you know, all familiar tropes and, you know, I, I bet there's a, a pancake eating ceremony out there at some point, um, given uh, Suga's um, preference for pancakes. But again, going back to that personal leadership thing, I, I wouldn't want anything, one of my favourite words is twee. I wouldn't want anything twee to come out of this opportunity. I mean, if, if um, Prime Minister Morrison is, is to make a visit here, and if it is one of the first the, to come in this post-COVID era, that's too good an opportunity to really sort of waste on frivolous little sort of things and just jump straight into and say, right, where can we go from here? Let's, you know, look at where we've been. What's, what can we do from here on and in a post-COVID world and, and not be too sort of personal about it, but think ahead um, of the legacy that they might uh, actually put in place down the track for Australia-Japan relations. Fantastic, Donna. Absolute pleasure to have you here. And I'll hand back to Emily now to do a final wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you, Donna. That was such a fantastic um, session this afternoon. We're very lucky to have two such experts as yourself um, sharing so much information and analysis with us. Um, I know after Prime Minister of his resignation this year, after having such a long serving and prominent uh, Prime Minister, uh, there's been a lot of appetite from our community for more information um, on Prime Minister Suga and who he is and who, what he's all about. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us this afternoon. Um, you made so many great points and I really thought um, great emphasis on all the opportunities for Australians going forward on kind of broader areas of our relationship with Japan, agriculture, inbound tourism, renewables and education as well. Um, and I just wanted to echo your, po your point, um, Donna, that it's great to see 
um, this kind of collaboration between business and education and research as well. Um, and as a chamber, this is something that we've really been focused on this year with our new technology, innovation, education and research committee as well. So I hope there'll be more opportunities like this um, going forward. Um, we're very fortunate to have you both with us today and thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. Have a great thank afternoon. You. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to start. <laughs>